come to order please good evening and welcome to the public hearing on behalf of the Alabama Department of Environmental Management at this time I would ask everybody to please mute or turn off your cell phones my name is Christy Monk I'm the hearing designated hearing officer for these proceedings the role of the hearing officer is limited to ensuring an orderly hearing so that an accurate record of this hearing may be developed for the department's evaluation. I do not make any decisions regarding the permit application. On behalf of the department, we appreciate your attendance and participation in tonight's hearing. In addition, we would like to extend our appreciation to Brian Dougal for helping us procure this facility this evening. The subject of this hearing is the proposed modification of underground injection control permit number ALSI 9902013. Currently held by Baldwin County Sewer Services for the wastewater treatment facility located at 16763 Alabama Highway 180, Gulf Shores, Alabama 36547 in Baldwin County. This hearing is being held in response to requests for such made by members of the public during the draft permits public comment period. The purpose of this hearing is to provide the public with an opportunity to present oral testimony on the proposed modification of this UIC permit. In addition to oral testimony, the department also will consider written comments submitted before the close of the public comment period. The department has requested your comments and we appreciate you taking the time to make them known to us. On April 15, 2022, notice of the date, time, place, and purpose of this hearing was posted on the department's website. The notice was also published in the Mobile Press Register on April 15, 2022, as well as the Foley Onlooker, the Gulf Shores Islander, and the Fairhope Courier on April 20, 2022. In addition, the department sent notice of this hearing by email to 1,727 individuals and organizations who had previously requested advance notice of permit proceedings. A copy of the notice and the email distribution list will be entered into the record for, of these proceedings. Copies of the public notice, permit application, preliminary determination, and draft permit have been made available for inspection by the public at the offices of the department at 1400 Coliseum Boulevard in Montgomery, as well as on the department's website. This hearing is open to the public and anyone wishing to present oral testimony or a written statement may do so. Those who have not previously completed a registration card to give testimony should do so at this time and present it at the registration table. Late, lengthy statements are those containing considerable technical or other complex data should be submitted in writing. Summaries of such statements may be presented orally. All testimony and written comments should be as factual as possible and should address the subject of this hearing. This hearing is an opportunity for members of the public to offer comments to help ensure that all relevant factors are considered before a final permit decision is made. In addition to oral testimony, written comments may be submitted. You do not have to make an oral statement tonight in order to have your written comments considered by the department. It is important to note that written comments are given the same consideration as those that are presented in person at this hearing. All oral and written testimony will be included in the hearing record. Persons giving testimony will not be subject to questioning by the public, but may be questioned by the hearing officer or other department staff to clarify points and to develop a better understanding of what is being presented. This proceeding tonight is not an open forum as in a question and answer session. Rather, it's an opportunity for you to submit comments that you wish the department to consider in the final review of the permit application. However, you may pose a comment in the form of a question, which will be compiled and addressed by the department in its complete response to comments. Written statements may be submitted to the hearing officer tonight or delivered to the department in Montgomery as directed in the public notice for this hearing. All the written statements previously submitted and those received by the department before 5 o'clock p.m. tomorrow, Friday, May 20th, 2022, will be included in the hearing record. Once complete, the hearing record, including the transcript of this hearing and all written submissions received by the department before the close of the public comment period, 
will be open to public inspection at the offices of the department in Montgomery. After giving full consideration to the hearing record, the Department of Environmental Management will announce its decision on the proposed permit modification. Now we'll move on to the purpose of this hearing, the receipt of public comments. The order of appearance of persons giving testimony will be as follows. First, a representative of the department. Second, a representative of the permittee. Then, all remaining members of the public will be heard in the order in which they file their registration cards. I will now recognize Mr. Jimbo Carlson to present a statement on behalf of the department. Good evening. My name is James Carlson. I am the chief of the stormwater management branch in the water division of the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. The underground injection control program, or UIC, is located within the stormwater management branch. Mr. Jeff All, a geologist, and Ms. Jessica Spence, an environmental scientist, both of which work in the UIC program, are also representing the department this evening. The state has been granted authority to administer the UIC program through the Safe Drinking Water Act. The department's UIC program has the authority to implement all applicable federal regulations, in particular 40 CFR Parts 124 and 144 through 146. The department received a permit modification application in, the, in December 2021 requesting an increase in flow at the Fort Morgan treatment plant from 1.2 million gallons per day to 2.0 million gallons per day. No other changes to the facility were requested in this application. After a comprehensive review of the permit ap modification application, a draft UIC permit was developed in accordance with state and federal regulations which are designed to protect groundwater. The draft permit was placed on public notice on January 26, 2022, and the department has received comments on this action. The department has made a preliminary determination that compliance by Baldwin County Sewer Service with the terms and conditions of the draft UIC permit will not result in violations of applicable state and federal regulations and will be protective of groundwater. The preliminary determination will be reconsidered after all comments are received and reviewed. Thank you. I now recognize Jenny Williams, Director of Marketing and Customer Relations for Baldwin County Sewer Services to make a statement at this time. Hello, I am Jenny Williams with Baldwin County Sewer Service, also known as BCSS. I am here today to respectfully request the department's approval of the recently submitted application to increase the treated discharge capacity of the Fort Morgan Wastewater Treatment Plant under its current underground injection control permit. The request is being made to allow BCSS to respond to the needs of the Fort Morgan service area. Service area. It is important to note that this increase is neither being sought for the expansion of the service area of the Fort Morgan plant, nor to accept flow from outside of the current service area. The Fort Morgan plant will continue to serve the same geographic areas and communities that it has provided for over 30 years. Increased tourism within the Fort Morgan area and related growth have resulted in the increase of wastewater flow to the Fort Morgan plant. Hydrogeology geologic studies conducted of the area surrounding the Fort Morgan plant indicate that the environmental conditions have the capacity to absorb and dissipate the additional hydraulic and nutrient loading resulting from the increased discharge limit. The decision to request the Fort Morgan permit modification was made after careful consideration of the environment and the needs of the community in this area. The needs to increase capacity of this treatment plant is based on past observations of growth and flows during tourist seasons, continued trends of record year-over-year -year growth in tourist and tourism-related growth in surrounding areas. There are several prominent venues in the southern part of Baldwin County that receive national attention, which has started to expand the tourist season beyond the traditional summer period. According to a recent local news article, Alabama's beach destinations have annual increases in 10 of the last 11 years, with last year seeing over 6 million visitors. 
As a neighbor, partner, and advocate for the environment, Bowen County Sewer Service is environmentally driven and community focused with its commitment to provide sanitary sewer service in the Fort Morgan service area. Our commitment to, sewer, to service is further demonstrated by converting 126 septic tanks to the sewer system since 2007 and pumping over 450 septic tanks since 2011. The Fort Morgan plan implements measures above permit required requirements, including telemetry on key aspects of the plan, which provides 24-7 plant monitoring and notice to employees, a BCSS employee always being on site, after hours phone call representatives, additional ser service employees on call 24-7, and a standby generator for the plan. We thank you for your time. Thank you. We will now proceed to the receipt of public comments in the order that the registration cards were submitted to the representative at the registration table. I would ask each person making a statement to step up to the microphone, clearly state your name and the name of any interest or organization that you represent. While speaking, please direct your comments toward me, not the audience, to ensure that the court reporter can accurately capture your testimony. Please also remember that this is not a question and answer session. I'm also requesting that everyone limit your comments to no more than five minutes as I have asked that lengthy statements be submitted in writing. If anyone has prepared a statement that cannot be presented in the five minute time frame, please use your time for oral testimony to summarize your comments and submit your full statement to the department in writing for placement into the record. I now recognize Claudia Adamson. And you can bend that mic if you need. Well, you're, you're a little tall there, okay. Yeah, there should be fine. thank you. <laughs> um, good afternoon, my name is Claudia Adamson and I'm here with the West Beach Property Owners Association. So I currently got, I recently got my bachelor's degree in animal ecology and biology from Iowa State University within the College of Natural Resources, Ecology and Management. And though I'm only here on vacation, I felt that I needed to speak on this subject. As a recent graduate, I am one of many future wildlife environmental managers being forced to advocate to prevent pollution already known to cause harm. Baldwin County Sewage Services proposal to change the permits to allow them to dump 800,000 gallons of waste into the lagoon is gross, grossly negligent. These permits are created not out of spite to corporations but protect the people and the other life that are affected by, these, uh, by this waste. By proposing this change in this permit, they are discounting years of research, environmental regulations, and the quality of life of all biotic factors within this ecosystem. In the question and answer um, meeting before this, before this talk, I was told that we can't estimate or discuss what trends of the future will be. If you aren't able to trust the trends of decreased oxygen in the waters due to this pollution, then how can we be sure that dumping of waste wouldn't cause further harm to the ecosystem? They are also ignoring an obvious solution to the problem, which is Narita. Already integrated into the city of Foley, this wastewater treatment facility provides an opportunity to maintain healthy bodies of water and make further efforts towards a more sustainable future. Some of many of the benefits of this facility include reducing the space required for sludge system by four times and energy savings up to 50% compared to the activated sludge processes. While the creation of this facility is more costly compared to the ease of dumping waste into the lagoon, I encourage you to think of the future, the damage to the ecosystem, and the overall cost of loss of revenue because of unhealthy waters is priceless. This council has the uh, ability to protect the biological hotspot and encourage corporations to act sustainably. I'm not speaking just for those species unable to, but as a representative of the future generations that will have to deal with the long-term consequences of this decision. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Rhonda, Rhonda Richardson Cavides. I'll help you out with that. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> There you go. All right. All right. So getting the, the name and everything out of the way and who I'm here representing. 
My name is Rhonda Richardson Caviedes, and I'm a resident of Dallas, Texas, uh, with Strong Ties to Alabama and uh, Gulf Shores. Um, I am here representing a number of individuals, uh, my parents, Charles and Mary Richardson, and I am representing the Lagoon Mobile Home Subdivision Property Owners Association, and I am here as a member of the Little Lagoon Preservation Society. So with that, I'll begin my talk. Okay, first of all, I like to say that I was born and reared in Alabama. I received my mechanical engineering degree and my law degree from universities in the great state of Alabama. I have, for the past 20 years, focused my law practice on construction law and environmental law. Although I am licensed to practice in the states of Alabama and, Tennessee, and Texas, I am not here in my capacity as a lawyer. I'm here in my capacity as a daughter. And the things that I'm going to present, I'm going to give you some background information, and I will try, time permitting, to set forth a roadmap of issues that my fellow society members will address in more detail. I'm a daughter of aging parents, and due to illness cannot be here to speak for themselves at this hearing. They have owned a home in Gulf Shores for the past 17 years in the Lagoon Mobile Home Subdivision. Their home is adjacent to the BCSS wastewater treatment plant. Over the past year, I've made regular trips to Gulf Shores to take care of their home. Baldwin County Sewer Service is a privately owned for-profit corporation, not Baldwin County. And that has petitioned ADEM to modify its existing permit to allow a 65% increase in processing capacity at its Fort Morgan plant. Unfortunately, before BCSS has received a permit to increase its capacity, it has built a sewage sludge lagoon on the edge of its property, side by side with residential area. Not only is it too close to those homes, but the lagoon has been operating in a careless fashion and has subjected the folks who live there next door to a constant assault from noxious odors and swarms of insects. In May of 2021, BCSS began clear-cutting the land immediately adjacent to my parents' property and that of some other residents of the subdivision to prepare the site for the sludge lagoon. BCSS, however, had not given ADEM notice as required in its 2014 UIC permit as planned changes in the sludge disposal practice, and I quote, which according to the permit provides, quote, sludge stabilization slash digestion methods, end quote, and the lagoon is clearly a digestion method and had not obtained a tree permit, stormwater permits, or land disturbance permits from any authority having jurisdiction. However, the city of course issued a stock work order. At the same time, CDG engineers and associates was preparing and submitting a permit application to ADEM on behalf of BCSS. The CDG report says nothing about the new sludge pond, Moreover, the lagoon was already under construction, a 1.1 million gallon sewage sludge lagoon, less than 100 feet from the back door of my parents' home. No engineering plans, no specifications were submitted to ADM or the city, and no required construction permits were obtained. In addition, I can find no evidence that EPA application form 2C was filed for either the 2014 permit or part of the new permit application form 2S. Of course, is a required form and required submittal of a map and line drawings of all on-site sewage sludge facilities, including treatment, storage, and disposal sites. There are other issues with the permit application, including the following. Non-conforming use, unpermitted con uh, construction. ADEM has regs requiring at least 500 feet between sludge storage and inhabited structures prior to sludge being applied in the land application agricultural setting. If ADEM recognizes the public health risk of having sludge stored near people, why would ADEM allow sewage sludge to be left in a 1.1 million gallon sludge lagoon within 100 feet of where people live and sleep and have their daily lives? Thankfully, the city of Gulf Shores recognizes issues with the sludge lagoon and issued a cease and desist order to BCS last, not, last week requiring BCSS to stop using the lagoon and have it emptied and filled in. 
If BCSS reasons for holding the sludge lagoon was so that it could retrofit the existing sludge digester to process the increased sewage capacity it seeks, the permit application should be denied, was not set forth in the CDG report. Other violations, exceedance of uh, processing rate, SSOs, uh, discharge limitations. Yesterday, ADM Land Division issued a warning letter to BCSS because they were illegally storing two to three tons of biosolids on their plant site. Yesterday, I personally discovered one of their monitoring wells is not secured, so we have no idea of the reliability of the data that's been taken from that well. In summary, BCSS is not operating the plan in full compliance with its existing permit. Why should it be allowed to increase its capacity by 65%? Incre increased capacity is just another way of saying increased profit for BCSS. Remember, this is a company in business to make a profit for its owners and shareholders. Bottom line, this permit application should be denied for these reasons and others that will be submitted in writing to ADAM. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Lori Eberly. Hi, I'm Lori Eberly. I'm a member of Little Lagoon Preservation Society. My husband and I have lived on Little Lagoon full time since 2008. Literally, not a month has gone by since 1980 that I haven't stood on the banks of the lagoon. Our children, grandchildren, friends, and family come here to play on the water. Now you know why I care so much about this permit. My eyes tell me there's more algae than there used to be, and it's increasing. I realize eyes can be deceiving. ADEM published a study in 2000 where data was collected from 30 recorded sites throughout the lagoon. Nutrient and pollutant facts are recorded. The Alabama Coastal Area Management Program, known as ACAMP, requires that Baldwin County Sewer Service do some tests to tell us what's in the lagoon now. Know for certain if their processed wastewater sitting in their perp ponds is adding nutrients and pollutants to the aquifer before you even consider allowing them to inject two million gallons per day. I know the residents, city, local businesses, visitors, ADEM, and BCSS employees are united in our desire to protect this precious area we all love. Obviously, all sewage has to be treated. Modern wastewater treatment facilities required to meet ADEM specs and monitor pollutions do a good job replacing septic tanks that have outlived their usefulness. In Gulf Shores, septic tanks are no longer allowed to be installed or repaired. We absolutely need regulated wastewater treatment facilities designed and staffed by diligent stewards of the environment who are meeting their specs set by ADEM to work miracles daily to keep our waters clean. Let's join efforts to ensure this fragile coast and all of Bowen County are treated with utmost care our citizens and environment deserve. ADEM, please apply and enforce all environmental protections available. When talking about sewer plants, the term NIMBY comes to mind, not in my backyard. I think a new word applies here, Jimby, just in my backyard. We residents of Gulf Shores are obligated to accept the treatment of wastewater generated in Gulf Shores. We are not obligated to assume the hazards of piping raw sewage originating in other areas of Baldwin County outside of the protected A Camp area. According to Baldwin County Sewer Service website, they serve more than 200 subdivisions how many of these are piped to the Fort Morgan plant? Only six have Gulf Shores zip codes. How many gallons of sewage do the six neighborhoods, private homes and businesses within the city limits of Gulf Shores generate on a daily basis? Would the Fort Morgan plant be able to successfully operate within their current permit of 1.2 million gallons per day, which happens to be their documented plant design capacity? if the flow volume was better controlled by treating the remaining 200 plus subdivisions, private homes and businesses at facilities within the various cities where they are physically located, needlessly piping raw sewage from an area outside A Camp into this environmentally protected area is in conflict with A Camp regulated protections. 
BCSS operates four other facilities in Baldwin County. There's no reason to overload the aging Fort Morgan plant. Equitable routing of raw sewage is a more reasonable solution. BCSS cannot continue to take on a larger customer base than their facilities can legally handle. ACAMP regulation conflicts and common sense given the existence of four alternative sites owned by BCSS and multiple capable modern municipal treatment facilities in Baldwin County require that this permit be denied. Thank you for your time and I ask that you please give your full attention to the impressive group of residents to follow who bring a wealth of knowledge to this hearing. We as individuals can personally do so much to make the job of wastewater treatment easier. I encourage everyone to take a look at the websites of the local treatment facilities or better yet take a treatment plant tour. Learn how you can help. Let's all be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Thomas Eberly. Hello, my name is Tom Everly. Right about now you probably think I'm Lori's dad, but I'm actually her husband. <laughs> I'm a retired chemical engineer with 22 years of experience. Anyway, the chemistry occurring in the wastewater treatment co process is complex, but the basic concept is quite simple. In a nutshell, we're trying to speed up what Mother Nature already does. From the aerial view shown of the BCSS Fort Morgan facility, I want to point out the key features to help everyone follow the discussion. Here's the beginning point of the process. This is a plastic lined pond called an equalization basin. This is where the raw sewage continuously enters the process. Trash is screened out and the bacteria called recycled sludge is added. The basin is also aerated. Now the bacteria can do its work on the sewage. This partially treated sewage is continuously transferred from the equalization basin into this large tank. This tank has two functions. The outer ring further treats the sewage. The inner section is called a clarifier. The clarifier removes the bacterial sludge solids, leaving clearer water behind. Most of this sludge is returned to the equalization basin. The rest of this sludge needs to be removed from the process. This is called waste sludge. Prior to this year, Baldwin County Sewer used this tank to hold and further treat the waste sludge. They would then filter it to a cake-like consistency and eventually send it to farm fields to be used as fertilizer. This year, Baldwin County stopped treating waste sludge in the tank. Instead, they pumped the untreated liquid sludge directly to the new sludge lagoon. The serious issues concerning the sludge lagoon have already been discussed. These changes were most likely made to retrofit the old sludge tank to increase raw sewage treatment capacity at the plant. If so, we could not find any mention of these changes in the publicly available information that ADEM shares in their e-file system, including the most recent CDG engineering report. Now let's talk about these percolation ponds. These are open ponds with no liner. The water exiting the clarifier is continuously pumped to these perk ponds. These perk ponds are designed to simply allow the water to seep through the sandy soil and pass into the groundwater just below. This groundwater, referred to as an aquifer, is not stationary as many may think. It actually flows under our feet slowly towards Little Lagoon and possibly to Oyster Bay. Now let's switch gears to Little Lagoon water quality. Baldwin County Sewer is currently allowed to discharge up to 1.2 million gallons per day and are asking to increase to two million gallons per day. Big numbers can get confusing. So to put this into perspective, during the year 2021, Baldwin County Sewer discharged enough water to equal 10% of Little Lagoon's total volume. This is not a drop in the bucket. So why should we be so concerned about this water? Even though it is clear, it still contains a small amount of dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus which are key ingredients of fertilizer. The concentration may seem low, but the phosphorus concentration of this water is more than 100 times higher than that of Little Lagoon. If this fertilizer reaches Little Lagoon or Oyster Bay, algae blooms will occur. 
Many people that know Little Lagoon are very concerned about the increased algae over the years. There are seven monitoring wells around the site. These wells are supposed to tell us the fate of this fertilizer in the groundwater. Due to, in 2014, due to a change in the ADEMS permit, testing of these monitoring wells was drastically reduced. For example, since 2014, there have been no phosphorus testing of the water leaving the process, nor of the monitoring wells. Even testing for bacteria has been discontinued. I analyzed the data for the last 12 years for the plant discharge and for the monitoring wells. I had to check this far back to get a clear picture of phosphorus levels since it's no longer tested. Rather than bore you with all the detail, I will read just a few key points in my detailed letter to Ada. In summary, Ada must deny this permit request for the following reasons. Number one, an environmental impact study must be performed to assess the impact on Little Lagoon and Oyster Bay before more nutrients or pollutants are added into the adjacent groundwater. Number two, since 2014, more than 20 permit violations occurred due to volume exceedances and discharge water quality failures. These failures occurred year after year after year, mostly in June and July. My detailed analysis shows the BCSS plant cannot effectively process the proposed increase in volume based on publicly available information in the e-file system. Number four, phosphorus has not been monitored for over eight years since the permit change. Based on pre-2014 data, high phosphorus levels are likely reaching Little Lagoon, creating excess algae growth. Adam has shown no evidence to refute this. And number five, there are numerous serious errors and omissions in the CDG engineering report, which are all the basis for the permit application. For the above reasons, Ada must deny. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Dennis Hatfield. I'm Dennis Hatfield. I'm president of Little Lagoon Preservation Society. Uh, we currently have over 280 member families. Um, I am part of a team, and you're hearing from them right now. This team consists of a geologist, chemical engineer, process engineer, environmental engineer, uh, several wastewater treatment engineers, a fisheries professor, a university education professor, an educator, a legal professional, and a defense analyst. This team loves Little Lagoon, and they're active in numerous initiatives, including this issue. My team assignment is the subservice. I couldn't help but mention the egregious Sludge Lagoon. They built that lagoon immediately adjacent to a residential neighborhood to re-engineer their sludge processing. Are they no longer using the sludge digester tank? Just talked about. We believe the old digester can treat an additional 600,000 gallons a day of sewage for the proposed increase. If so, is this a violation of their existing permit? Is this an expansion of a non-conforming use? And is this a preparation for the proposed permit increase, which was not approved at the time they did it? Does this demonstrate poor decision making and a lack of care for people and the environment. The fate of phosphorus fertilizer in the subsurface. We estimate six tons per year of the element P, no pun intended, is put into the aquifer at the plant. P levels are sometimes high in wells and seeps in the Brigadoon area. Subsurface in the subsurface environment may inhibit mineralization of P to allow it to reach the lagoon. More P equals more algal blooms. Some of them are toxic. Please convince us this plant is not contributing P to Little Lagoon and will not deliver more P to Little Lagoon and Oyster Bay with the increase. Please resume stringent monitoring. <coughs> The fate of nitrogen fertilizer in the subsurface. 
We estimate seven tons per year of nitrogen is put into the aquifer. Um, ammonia is one of the, the elements. It's highly toxic to marine life. It may persist in the subsurface. Subsurface denitrification is likely significant. The Dr. BB preliminary results from stable isotope work did not clearly point at the processing plant. However, we are uncertain uh, about dispersion, dilution, mixing, down dip flow direction of the aquifer. We worry that we don't yet completely understand a complex and multivariate system. More nitrogen in the lagoon equals more algae. Please convince us the plant is not contributing and will not contribute uh, more fertilizer to Little Lagoon Oyster Bay. Increase monitoring. Okay, the CGD report denitrification rate used in their study. Was this pulled from a thesis study or was it calculated using the method the author described in the thesis? Did the data used to build the author's statistical model come from wastewater treatment plants? Half of the data has been lost per the author who doesn't remember or know the answer to that question. The statistical model is intriguing. However, the master's thesis was never published. It did not undergo scientific community and professional peer review. Um, is this method accepted? Where else has it been used? Plant affluent surfacing. The water table surface at the plant can be as high as 14 feet above sea level. Evidence in the Brigadoon area south of the plant is the aquifer is at the surface on land close to Little Lagoon. A 14 foot elevation drop to near sea level is enough head pressure for flow and surfacing. Is this not contradictory to permanent requirements that affluent should not surface on its journey to Little Lagoon? Please carefully analyze this geology. Assure us that the fluid is not surfacing. Um, I will submit a detailed paper. I have a list of recommendations. Please review it. Please review the other members' recommendations on our team. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Lloyd Moore. Good evening. I'm Lloyd Moore, a Gulf Shores resident and also a member of the Little Lagoon Preservation Society. I've looked at a couple of the documents submitted for this capacity increase. Uh, they are an injection well permit application that was prepared by the Baldwin County Sewers Consultant, CDG, and a draft permit prepared by ADEM. Both of these documents have many errors and omissions that ADEM should address. They are too numerous to cover in the time we have been given. I'll mention just a few. Extensive details have been submitted as comments and are located in the ADEM e-file system. I urge ADEM to review them. I'll start with the CDG permit application. The application does not even show the current plant configuration. Baldwin County made a major modification to the sludge treatment system by removing the sludge digester and sludge press and replacing them with some kind of lagoon that is not included in this application. This application also presents data on the pond percolation rates that appear to be incorrect. If the percolation rates of water settling into the ground were at the rate CDD shows, uh, there should never be any standing water in the four ponds. Both ADEM inspection photographs and past satellite images show continuous standing water in these ponds. Also, a 2010 ADEM document 
identified sanitary sewer overflows as contaminant sources that could severely impact water quality in Little Lagoon. Uh, for that 2010 report, Aiden reviewed their files and identified overflows from the percolation ponds as one of these sources. One glaring omission in the application is a lack of specifications or documentation showing that the treatment system itself is designed to process this increase. There are apparently no plans for changes to increase the plant capacity. All past documentation, all past documents has specified the plant was designed for 1.2 million gallons a day, not 2 million gallons a day. In 2018, Baldwin County Sewer asked ADEM to double the allowed ammonia limit because the plant did not have enough retention time to maintain both the nitrate and ammonia limits. Since the plant was reclassified in 2014, there have been at least 24 violations. The majority of these violations have occurred during the month of June and July, which is the highest treatment period for our area. For example, last July, the plant violated the BOD limit 75% of the time. When Adam sent Baldwin County a warning letter asking why, they said they didn't really know why. Last July, they also had very high treatment flows that violated the flow limit. They even had one day above two million gallons. Uh, the, the ADEM draft permit has, has issues that, that we feel are, that need to be addressed. The draft permit is misleading and confusing on what the flow limit actually is. In one section, it states that the daily flow shall not exceed two million gallons a day. In a separate section, it states that the monthly flow average cannot exceed two million gallons a day. There's a big difference between a monthly average and a daily limit. A monthly average limit allows periods of operation far above the design limit of the plant. It should be removed. It appears that Baldwin County and ADEM want to focus on what they claim the ponds can handle, not what the actual plant treatment uh, limit should be. Because there's a lot of things that happen, as, as was discussed earlier, with the incoming, the treatment, the bugs, the aeration, and that system was designed for 1.2 million, not two. And we've seen no documentation anywhere in the ADEM system saying that it is good to process two million gallons a day. Uh, also, in 2014, ADEM changed this, the type of, of permit this plant is under and went to the underground, uh, I'm sorry, class five injection well. One major change at that time was that the testing and reporting requirements were drastically reduced. Uh, Baldwin County no longer needs to test for things like phosphate, E. coli, coliform, residual chlorine. Uh, also, the mandatory annual sludge testing and the mandatory sludge inventory, along with nonconformance reporting, was eliminated in this current permit as opposed to the permit that was under the NPDES system. Uh, these tests and reports need to be reestablished. ADEM also needs to consider adding back the annual municipal water pollution prevention, MWWP report as this summarizes the year's operation and other parameters of the plant's operation, including how the plant is operated, what they plan to do in the future. Uh, in summary, I feel ADEM should look closely at this requested increase as it was presented to us and deny it. Uh, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Where do I drop this? Oh, you can hand it to me. Oh, do I need to? Oh, wow, okay. Thank you. I now recognize Alan Gibson. First of all, I'll give you a little bit of, uh, on my background. I'm Al Gibson. My wife and I live on the Little Lagoon and are members of the Little Lagoon Preservation Society. We're concerned about the overall water quality as the lagoon is used by our children as well as guests and neighbors. I'm a professional geologist and a professional engineer. I spent the last 52 years working on water, resources and waste management primarily for the mining industry. Let's start 
by looking at the affluent rate described in the CDG Engineers and Associates report. The report was prepared to support increasing effluent flow rates to the ponds from 1.2 million gallons a day to 2 million gallons a day. The supporting calculations were based on an infiltration rate of 1.5 million gallons per day rather than two. So the permit should be denied because of this inconsistency. It is informative to look at the rest of the report even though it is based on a lower than requested discharge rate. Next, the information presented in the report is not sufficient to truly evaluate the affluent ponds. For instance, there are no as-built drawings or design drawings, survey locations and elevations of the soil borings and monitoring wells, and no completion details for the monitoring wells. There was no topographic map of the site. Now I want to look at the impact of the proposed effluent flow on the ponds. There's about 3.5 feet of effluent in the ponds. The CDG design analysis indicates that the ponds can infiltrate 1.5 million gallons per day effluent plus rainfall from a 100-year, 24-hour storm event in eight hours. There's, thus, there should be no affluent in the ponds. This indicates that 3.5 feet of water pressure is needed to drive the affluent from the ponds. Thus, the ponds are not performing as indicated by the analysis. Also, the actual affluent flow rate from the ponds should be about twice the current rate. Per a crude estimate, it would take seven feet of water pressure head to drive the infiltration into the ponds. This would mean the pond levels would need to be raised about three feet above the current ground level. This was not discussed in the CDG report. Next, I want to look at the groundwater flow direction and potential areas of impact. The groundwater flow directions are not defined outside the plant limits, but the groundwater flow likely to the south to the Brigadoon subdivision and Little Lagoon and the north towards Oyster Bay. There are no monitoring wells north or south of the plant site to confirm this and monitor water quality. Monitoring wells should be added north and south of the ponds. It is standard practice to conduct a spring and seep survey at the start of a project so that the locations and water quality of the existing seeps are known and any new seeps associated with the plant operation can be identified. The draft underground injection control permit has required the requirement that injected influent shall not surface after injection. There's a pond of green slime adjacent to the northwest corner of the plant by the trailer park. It clearly looks like the pond is a result of seepage from the ponds. This and the operation would be a violation of the draft permit. There are also potential seeps in the Brigatoon subdivision and wetlands around Oyster Bay. Additionally, there's likely seepage entering the Little Lagoon and Oyster Bay. It is strongly recommended that a spring and seep survey be conducted. Based on my experience, an environmental impact statement is usually prepared to identify potential harmful effects on the environment. If an EIS has not been prepared, one should be prepared. In summary, the CDG report was not presented in accordance with the ordinary standard of care and skill normally ex exercised by similar professionals providing similar services in the same geographic location and at the same time. Given the numerous, numerous technical errors in the report and analysis, the permit modification should be denied. As a general comment, this is the worst report I have seen in my 50 years as a consulting engineer. It amazes me that this report was signed and stamped by an Alabama registered professional geologist and an Alabama registered professional engineer. Thanking you in advance for your consideration of these points. I now recognize Ron Phelps. First, I'd like to uh, thank Adam for coming down and hearing us. That um, 
there are a lot of questions, as you can see, regarding the impact of this sewage treatment plant. And we don't have data enough to make decisions from. And that, to me, is an aggravation. I come from a background, I have a PhD in fisheries. I've worked in 26 different countries around the world in aquaculture development. I've even tried to raise fish in sewage water. But we have a lot to learn and we don't have the information available in front of us now. Um, the proposed permit as it stands is a major change by ADEM's definition of change. And with that, there should be a environmental impact study. But I cannot find any environmental impact studies on the current permit or even the past permits. I would like to request a detailed environmental investigation and remediation guidance be prepared before we continue on trying to decide what to do with this item or with the BCSS plant. The, as already mentioned, the plant has a number of problems working at its current level. That <clears throat> if we looked at the plant now, uh, it has, in theory, uh, 1.2 million gallons a day flow. With that setting, they have had seven flow violations in eight years. They've also exceeded nutrient levels 15 times since 2014. There are issues that need to be addressed. In other words, why should we consider allowing them to expand to two million gallons when they cannot even manage 1.2 million gallons? Uh, as part of the uh, ADEM regulations, they very specifically say the ponds should drain dry. There is information these ponds have not been dry completely since 1985. There's every year there's some water still standing in these ponds. And there's a, a number of reasons perhaps for those, but there's just not time to go into those. Um, what we need to think about is let's look at the permitted volume and the 1.2 million gallons per day if we put this on a yearly basis this is 58.6 million cubic feet of water going into the percolation ponds these percolation ponds are 7.2 acres of land that's a lot of water and it's got to go somewhere. Where is it going? We don't know. We've got some studies underway, but we do not know where that water is going. And how could we decide to increase the volume if we don't even know where we have and where it's going? Um, so if we look at this from another view, um, we need to think about rainfall. Uh, those percolation ponds receive rainfall and they see, receive wastewater. In the uh, Gulf Shores area, we get 65 inches of rain a year. Um, if we translate that back, that is just a fraction of what the volume is from the wastewater coming in. It's roughly, um, for every cubic foot of rainfall that we get, we're putting 29 cubic feet of water in through those ponds through seepage. So we need to understand 
what is going on and what can be done about it. If we looked at it from, say, a nutrient perspective, the quantity of nutrients based on data from one of their sampling wells, um, if we put this on a per acre basis, where most of us think, that volume of wastewater has a nutrient potential of 152 pounds per acre of ammonia, 2,105 pounds of total, potas uh, total phosphorus, and 507 pounds of total nitrogen. That sounds like a lot. Let you think if I was fertilizing a fish pond for bass or bluegill or what have you, the typical rate there is 24 pounds per acre per year compared to the thousand pounds. If I was raising soybeans, it's 30 pounds of phosphorus per acre per year. If I was putting it on my lawn, the nitrogen level is 100, excuse me, 131 pounds per acre per year. Uh, cotton, um, 390 pounds. You can see normal practices, normal fertilization is much less than what we're already contributing into the water column. We don't know though where that water is going. So before we do anything, we need to have a better understanding of where that wastewater is going, how much of those nutrients are reaching the lagoon, and then from there, consider we could expand the plant. But let's not make any decisions until we understand what is currently going on. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Brenda Hunt, excuse me, Brenda Hancock. Everybody's taller than me. Uh, I'm a member of the Little Lagoon Society. I've been on the board for a few years, decades, like. Uh, the Lagoon Society was founded in, I believe, 1992 and it had to do with the opening of the pass, keeping it clean. My dad bought the house I grew up in in 1961, and in the summer, in the winter, you could go out, you could look down your pier, three, four, five feet of water, and it was clear. Then little by little, especially after Frederick in 74, and development started to blow up. Then we get into the 80s, condos and more housing on West Beach now. There have been a lot of people talking big numbers about science that I don't really understand, but one thing I do understand is water clarity. And year after year after year after year, it has gone to where now, out on my pier, it wasn't until oyster gardening began through Little Lagoon Society, we coordinated with different agencies. And around where those oysters were growing, the water was clear. Now, if this plant gets 65% more waste, and I found out this afternoon that my house on County Road 12 comes down here in Fort Morgan. Now, that just seems silly to me that they want to pump waste south to an area that, one, is an ecological miracle with our salt water and fresh water marsh down here. And two, there's a whole lot of money involved. And if we screw this up, when that plant first was built, every day when I drove by, you could smell it way before you got to it. Now, I don't know what those numbers are compared to right now, but I do know the people that live in that trailer court, they're probably not real happy. The people down by Lagoon Baptist Church, they're probably not real happy. I'm a little farther down. But um, ecologically and economically, this is just a very bad 
idea. Thank you. And now recognize David Adams. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yes, I live at uh, 544 Windmill Ridge Road. I've lived there for 46 years. Uh, that property's been in our family for 86 years. Throughout my life, I have watched the health of the little lagoon decline. I came here to ask a bunch of questions, but obviously it's not a question and answer thing. I can't speak to the science, but I sure appreciate all the people that have. What I don't understand is how, how does a company build a sludge pond and ADEM, who's supposed to be inspecting it, doesn't catch that? How in the world are we here entertaining an increase of flow, a permit for that, when they're not in compliance? Thank you. I now recognize Paul Cheek. Good evening. Hello. Thank you for being here and coming to provide some answers for us. As you see tonight, many of us have a lot of questions and they're totally unanswered. And I'm not an academic PhD or a lawyer, thank goodness. Or <laughs> of all these professional people that have spoken their word tonight, I'm just a semi-retired old CEO who's trying to make it go. My concern is that of many in the Little Lagoon Association, which I reside and represent. We're concerned about the water quality in the Little Lagoon. I found out about what was happening through the mullet wrapper. Now, that, that's a tremendous newspaper here in Gulf Shores. Many of us don't live in Mobile. We don't live in Fairhope, or we don't live in the other places, but we live here. And I would say the majority of a lot of us in our families did not even know that this was coming up. When I read it in the wrapper, I immediately called my representative and I'd say, what the heck is going on? Maybe a little different worded. <laughs> but he says, Paul, I don't know. We haven't heard anything about it. So it went to the mayor and the mayor was published, I think, in the wrapper and don't quote me. We weren't really aware of what was going on either, but we think we need to have an opinion gathering meeting to see what's happening. So my point is this. You've had this evening that I've had the ability to listen to personally. I've heard professional expertise. I've heard legal representation. I've heard concern about people who have been here for years. And I am only one voice, but I represent many. And I can tell you, we are totally against this whole shebang that's going on in front of us. And that's what we think it is, a shebang. <laughs> because we don't know the answers. And there's only one answer I would like to say. You've had legal, you've had expertise, you've had everything. But did they ever present to you a population density study? That is critical because if you look at this map, and this wasn't planned, I just got on off the airplane about four hours ago in New Orleans and got here in time. If you look at the surrounding area of the map, you should know how many planned subdivisions are already underway. Did they ever contact the city of Gulf, of Gulf Shores planning and zoning to ask what the future plans were for this area in terms of new housing, yep. residential housing? Was that ever done? Because everything that we said scientifically, legally here tonight could be thrown out the window of what we have currently existing underway. Within a third of a mile of this plant, there are new subdivisions, broken ground and under, underway already. Now, you talk about volume and flow, which I understand is very critical. 
So my concern was this, when I read in the newspaper that uh, outside affluent would be brought in here to be processed, I had a problem with that. And according to the spokesperson tonight, and as a lawyer, she went on record saying they're not going to bring in any outside influence. Well, that's not what I read in the newspaper. So the answers are very important for us to understand in order to make a really adequate decision. And in closing, there's one thing I do know. I've lived here for nine years, right on the Little Lagoon, and I've watched the water every morning as I wake up, I look at that water. And I've watched the water quality totally deteriorate during that time. I'll wake up some mornings and I'll see foam floating all over my outside of my area. Or I'll see excessive dead fish and I will tell you this, it's disheartening to see that Adam would recognize this plant to increase the volume of effluent that's going in there from a nutrient flow. So as part of our association group, I urge you to make a right decision. You know, there's three decisions you make in life I've learned. The right one, the wrong one, and most important is the wise one. You need to make a wise decision when concerning what we're doing here. You've heard everybody here tonight. I, I didn't realize we had so many outstanding individuals in this area. <laughs> the quality of the, of the message that you said, both legally and professionally, should be listened to. So I thank you once again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. I now recognize Rick, either Keefen or Kiefer. Thank you. I'm Rick Kiefer, and I live at 520 Lagoon, uh, 520 Retreat. And it's in the peninsula. Uh, it's about a mile and a half to the west of the plant. Prior to that, previous four years, we lived in uh, Little, Little Lagoon uh, Tower, Lagoon Tower, right on Little Lagoon and uh, look out at the water every day and it's like it, that's nasty i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't swim in that thing i was even careful about just getting in it to kayak because the water quality in there is awful i mean it's brown and i don't think it's brown from algae i think it's brown from other things okay you know i'm, I'm not a phd i'm not a lawyer thank god and <laughs> just everyday common citizen but in my way of thinking why do we have a sewer plant emptying sewage into a waterway especially considering that tourism is our livelihood here in this town if we don't have tourism this town doesn't exist okay our water our beaches are not nearly the water is not nearly as clean as Florida if you go over to Florida you go over to Destin or Panama City, their water is a lot bluer than ours. Now I understand part of that is because we have more rivers flowing into ours, but also part of it could be some of this water management that we're not doing. And if if the water quality goes bad here, these tourists aren't going to come here. This tourists don't come here. Not only does this town dry up, but the number one tourist destination for the entire state of Alabama goes away. In fact. What I've read, 60% of all the tourist dollars in the entire state is right here at Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. You can't afford for that to happen. The impact of Alabama, not only financially, but also just in reputation, would be horrible. We moved here from McKinney, Texas. Uh, it's Collin County, just north of Dallas. What's unique about there is they have a water problem with a lack of water. So what they did there is they took the sewage and they, instead of just dumping it back into the river and flushing it down to Houston, like everybody does, they ran it through a wetlands. So they run it through a wetlands, reclaim the water, pump it back, and actually use the water for city drinking water. Everybody's water was reclaimed sewage water. 
why can't we do the same here? Why are we dumping sewage, granted treated sewage, but why are we dumping sewage in our important tourist area? You know, why not we think out of the box, think a little more progressively and say, hey, there's better ways to treat sewage than that. Secondly, why are we even thinking about taking sewage from Foley and points north of here and bringing it down here? They have wetlands up there. Put it in the wetlands up there. No reason you would pollute this area with the sewage from points north when they've got all this wetlands up there that they could be using. Think a little more in the future, Adam. Uh, the growth in this area is tremendous. We're the number one fastest growing city in all of Alabama. I think Foley is like number three or four. Uh, this area is growing tremendously. We're going to need increased sewage treatment. Think about better ways to do it than what you're doing right now. And for sure, don't give these people that can't even abide by what they're already granted to do, they can't even live up to their requirements now, even think about increasing the amount of sewage that you're going to allow them to. Anyway, that's my comments. Thank, Thank you. you. I now recognize Thomas Shepard. Good evening. My name is Tom Shepard. I live at 560 Windmill Ridge Road on the south side of the lagoon. Uh, we bought the property 10 years ago, but I've been coming down here every summer since the 1950s. In fact, I learned how to water ski when I was five years old on a little lagoon in 1959. So I've you know, this area and the lagoon especially is very important to me. Um, I appreciate the, the hearing tonight, but more importantly, I also appreciate the time you guys took prior to this meeting down the street to answer questions, uh, both from you guys and BCCS. I learned a lot of information that was really not available before that question and answer period. <clears throat> the, uh, as everybody stated several times, the current, the current capacity of the, um, of the treatment facility is 1.2 million gallons per day. When I questioned BCCS about that, they admitted that is the capacity, but they have an abandoned facility, an older waste treatment uh, facility on the plant is the way they put it, but it's the old aerator they have there. They've already designed, according, this is verbally I got from BCCS tonight, they've already completed the design and purchased all the equipment required to retrofit and, re, and, and put the old plant back in service, which is going to add 600,000 gallons per day capacity. So the capacity will be increased from 1.2 to 1.8. Why they're permitting, asking for 2 million, he couldn't answer. It doesn't make sense. The capacity is 1.8, not 2.0 million. Um, there has been some talk that maybe there's a difference between the 1.8 million and the 2 million a day because they could rely on retention ponds as a buffer. That doesn't work. Um, it might work for some short period of time, maybe a matter of hours, but it doesn't make up for the difference on any ongoing basis between 1.8 and 2.0 million uh, gallons per day. So as there's a few holes in the permit that we think need to be plugged. The permit, I mean, there's, I, I'm not disagreeing with anything anybody said about the fact the permit shouldn't be approved at all, but if the permit is going to be rewritten, it needs to be rewritten for 1.8 million gallons per day. Any ambiguity between whether that's a daily average or a monthly average or daily peak or a monthly average needs to be clarified to make sure that it's a 1.8 million gallon per day peak, um, not, not a monthly average. The permit doesn't reference anything about the plant expansion from, from 1.8 from 1.2 to 1.8 million. In fact, I couldn't find anybody with ADEM that's even aware that was being contemplated. So the permit needs to contain, needs to contain any the design specs, uh, um, a design review and the design specs for the expansion to make sure that it really is 600,000 gallons per day, and it needs to be included as a prerequisite before um, before the plant can be expanded. Uh, also, I think there needs to be besides just a daily average, there needs to be a peak flow rate as well, uh, just you know, the, so that you can't. Um, over, overwhelm the, the treatment facility during short periods of time. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the, the current UIC, under the current UIC uh, permit, there's no requirement for monitoring or reporting, uh, no limits for phosphorus. 
I think the permit should contain a, a phosphorus limit and requirements for monitoring and reporting. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Sylvia Little. Good evening. I'm Good Sylvia evening. Little. I'm a resident on Windmill Ridge uh, in Gulf Shores on the island. I've been here for more than five years, full time. We live here. My husband fishes here. Um, our grandchildren are coming next week for Memorial Day and we will play here into May, June. We've got guests coming for the next, you know, three months. Um, and, and we'll be busy. And what we're starting to do is with the Little Lagoon Preservation Society, we will be oyster gardening to help with the fragile ecosystem that is Little Lagoon. I care, we care, we're out on our dock every single day uh, enjoying the water and the beauty that is here in Gulf Shores. I'm a chemical engineer. I um, spent my years at Georgia Tech uh, studying flow and uh, fluid dynamics and what I do have done for over 30 years as an engineer within Fortune 500 companies is help make hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions and there are just several design principles that I go by. One, you have data and, and you use your data to make data-driven decisions. I mean, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, basic. And what I haven't heard from anyone is responsible process control data that would allow us to have any sort of confidence at all that there is any reason why this permit should be approved. BCSS has yet to show that they are capable of controlling the environment and dealing with the consequences of the current capacity of this property. So there is no reason, I, I apologize, we have a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason to expand. This is a major expansion. 65% is way over the design and it's it takes a process out of control to the point where the risks are very great without great study of the impact to the ecology. You mentioned earlier, it's been mentioned about the service area that has been the service area for 30 years. I think that's where some of the confusion comes in because 30 years ago that treatment facility could probably handle the effluent from off of the island. There's been exponential growth. We're in the largest growing city, Gulf Shores, and this island is the largest growing city in the largest growing county in the state of Alabama. And it's ecologically fragile. You don't pump from less fragile, fragile places to more fragile places. It's just simple. When traffic we experience traffic. I live on Windmill Ridge Road, which everybody from West Beach has to go to because the hangout began today. When traffic backs up, sorry, it's been a bad day. <laughs> when traffic backs up, you call it a traffic jam. When our sewage system backs up, it's called a biohazard. don't kill our lagoon. I want it for my kids, I want it for my grandkids, and I want it for the kids of the kids of the kids of everyone in this room. Yeah. Thank you. I now recognize Reva Freilich. Good evening, my name is Reva Freilich. I'm a member of the Fairhope Unitarian Fellowship or Social and Environmental Action Committee. I'm also the uh, group leader of the Baldwin County Chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. And I'm also a member of the Mobile Bay Group of Sierra Club. Thank you for holding this hearing. 
in Gulf Shores on hangout weekend. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> it was a pleasure chatting with uh, some of you and learning about the sewage and the wastewater treatment process. Uh, I know this hearing is about volume, and Alabama has always believed that the solution to pollution is dilution. In this case, I want to address water quality issues in our area, not just surface water, but also groundwater in our aquifer. I learned from your pre-session that a large part of the problem are the seasonal tourists with their increased demand on the infrastructure. I discussed climate resilience issues with Mr. McManus of the BCSS and regarding sea level rise, hurricanes, storm surge, and extreme rain and flood events. I mentioned uh, water quality issues here in Baldwin County. We have a PFOS pollution in the Silver Hill outlying field of Navy Whiting area. There was a recent redfish kill in the Gulf of Mexico of unknown origin. And the plant berry online coal ash pond the, on the Mobile River, and the Mobile River is the third most threatened river in the United States. And now, the announcement of the Novellus Aluminum Recycling and Manufacturing Plant at the Megasite in Bay Minette, Alabama. We also have a cancer cluster here in Baldwin County. From just a quick perusal of the epa.gov website, there are water quality issues in treated wastewater that are, that are not even addressed in testing. And I don't mean to gross you out after dinner. Pathogens such as bacteria, viruses like E. coli, protozoa like toxoplasmosis, parasites, other microorganisms such as worms, hookworms, tapeworms, whipworms, causing salmonella, food poisoning, E. coli, e. coli typhoid fever, hepatitis A, you probably already know about the outbreak upstate in some children, dysentery, cholera, gastroenteritis. My father was a prisoner of war in World War II in the Philippines, and he had all those diseases. <laughs> Anyway, not to mention all the chemicals and the metabolites from drug use and diseases. Polio uh, can be uh, an effect, meningitis, pneumonia, encephalitis, paralysis, and respiratory infections. Please protect all our water sources supplies for now and evermore. And you are, you are our EPA, you're our Environmental Protection Agency for the state. So thank you and have a safe trip home. Bye. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Mayor Robert Kraft. Well, thank you. I'm not going to go into great detail. I had a prepared speech, but I don't think it's necessary. I think you've heard all of the, the great information here, and it is incumbent on you. And we, as much as I can, I demand that you pay attention. This meeting would not have happened had we not talked uh, Director LaFleur into having it. It was not scheduled to happen until we realized that this community had not been heard from. We are, this is, you, we've got to deal with the consequences of your decisions. And we've got a negligent operator, we've seen that, that this uh, un illegal expansion of a non-conforming use of the property would not have happened had they gone through the process, but they didn't go through the process. They, they built it illegally. They're going, to have to, they're going to have to move it. And it has caused real problems for our surrounding, the people that live there. I've been out there. You would not want to have to breathe out there. It, it was that bad. So we've got, we've got an operator that hadn't done it. You, there's a lot of quotes and a lot of data re relating to of items in, where they have been outside their permit, things that they've done that did, we're not supposed to do. So there's a degree of negligence that someone needs to be paying attention to. I, and I will claim, also proclaim that ADEM's been negligent too. You're no longer uh, pro, uh, uh, count, uh, uh, collecting samples and, and qu quantifying how much is going in there, the quality of the affluent, and you're wanting to add more. And let me ask you this, because this is a real concern. <laughs> You can't shut off sewer to someone. So you open this up, you give them two more, another up to two million gallons, and they add another four or five hundred homes on here. And it's wrong, and you mess up, and it is a problem. What are you going to do? You can't shut them off. You can't do that. You've got to be right here. You cannot take the chance on being wrong. 
You cannot. There's too much at stake here. You've got to pay attention. You've got to be testing. Know what they're doing. Know what's their, what the contaminants are. Know what the volume of that additional contaminant would do. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that did not? Real quick. Real quick. All right. <laughs> I couldn't even get my sentence out. <laughs> hey, my name is Reggie Pulliam. I live at 1416 East Fairway Drive. I Ray what? 1416. No, your last name. Reggie Pulliam. P is in purple. U-L-L-I-A-M. I live at 1416 East Fairway Drive. I have an insurance agency and I have a construction company in Gulf Shores. I'm also running for District 95 State Representative. We just came out today because this area is overdeveloped. It's getting overdeveloped and there's no plans in place and we're begging city and county officials to stop issuing permits and start issuing permits at a minimum of one quarter to one half an acre per home because that's going to get DR Horton and Truland and everybody out of this, out of this area. They'll run real quick. But I want, to tell you, I want to tell you a real story about something that happened to one of my employees. He got really sick and had these sores all over his body. And we thought it was from him working at one of our lots, in one of our homes, remodeling in the attic. Well, we took him to the ER this week, and it turns out he has a flesh-eating bacteria. And it turns out he, he admitted to us after we took him to the emergency room, he was on jet skis in Little Lagoon, he and his wife, over the weekend. He fell in. And so I'm not saying that this is happening in the Little Lagoon, but we, we didn't file a workers' comp claim for it because there's some, there's some bad stuff going on here. And as everybody knows, it's been here for a long time. The water's gotten more murky and more murky. And thank God, thank God for the oysters in the Little Lagoon. Because without that, I, I can't, the water will be that color, I presume. But um, thank you all for your time. And thank you guys, everybody, for being out here tonight. This is an amazing, amazing event. And this is what happens when the communities come together and we research and we talk and we, we make the change that we should see. Y'all have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that did not register that would like to speak? I have 30 seconds. Okay. My name is Paula Hendrickson. And in addition to everything that's been said, there's one thing I haven't heard that I would like. Whatever decision y'all make, and we all hope you deny this permit, but if you do issue that permit, would you please give us reasons in detail why you did it? You would have to refute all the evidence that you've heard in the comments, and don't give us general stuff. You've been given very specific information. So if you decide to issue that permit, we want to know why you did it in detail. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Okay. Very quick. Hi, um, hi I'm Alec Your name, Barnett. sir? Your name? Alec Barnett. And I, I just came this evening because I got invited. Just listen to the community. I'm the environmental chair for the state NACP. I'm also the president of Baldwin County NACP. Um, I just, you know, want like the mayor said, y'all do your job. That's all we want to see what's happened because I will be watching and looking very close, gathering data and evidence to give to the environmental attorney the attorney that I deal with uh, because we don't want this kind of stuff to happen in Baldwin County, nowhere really in the state. We have a lot of problems when, when they spoke about the area that's is not lined properly. That seeks into your ground. That's getting into your water, drinking water. And when people start having upper respiratory problem, then you're going to really have a real big problem. So we just want you to do your job, and we will be watching you. And also, I am running for county commissioner as well. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand high. No? Okay. 
uh, let the record reflect that no additional persons re are requesting to speak. Um, since there are no other attendees requesting to speak, please be advised that the public comment period will end tomorrow at 5 o'clock p.m. on Friday, May 20th. All comments must be received in the offices of the department in Montgomery by that time. After consideration of all oral and written comments, the department will make a determination regarding the modification of the permit and prepare a document responding to all relevant comments received. A notification indicating that the department has made a final determination regarding this permit modification will be provided to all commenters, commenters excuse me, and any of tonight's attendees that provided an email address or mailing address at the registration table or within their written comments. The department's final determination and response to comments will be made available in the department's e-file system. Thank you for your participation this evening. This hearing is adjourned.